Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me, as ever, is the professor, Alan Jameson. You doing all right, mate? Hello. Hello. I'm all right, yeah. What's your soundtrack to kick us off? Soundtrack today, ooh, probably Rosetta Stone by Tool. Nice. Okay, we're back on the Tool. Yeah. Good stuff. So this is episode 24, right? It is. Two-year anniversary. That means we've been doing this for two years. That's weird, isn't it? It is. It is. A little, little bit longer than that, technically, because I put like a little placeholder out like even earlier than that. But yeah, two years, 24 episodes. I, know, I don't think we've that much to say. Still going. Tell me lots of deep sea. I know. We're going to run out of guests. <laughs> and now we're just going to get weirder. There you go. Two years. Yeah. Two years of the deep sea podcast. Boom. You think after the two years, I, would have, I wouldn't have gone from a perfectly nice office in my house in Northumberland to sitting in a wardrobe in Australia. But here we are. It's supposed to be the other way around. I should be getting I should be getting my own studio, right? Definitely. Instead, I'm literally sitting on the floor in a, <laughs> a waste wardrobe. Well, you'd also think that after two years, it might be profitable, but it's certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. We do have merch. It's, it's, so we, do. we must be making something. We sold at least one penny. It's us buying it. <laughs> We're buying our own merch and paying for it. That's not true. I can honestly say in I, my, my whole Deep Sea Research Centre has moved this week into another building because we're growing so fast. And one of my postdocs has a skeleton called George Harriet. It's a full-size skeleton, and it's wearing a Deep Sea Podcast apron, and it's not the one you gave me. I assumed it was. Oh, I didn't know that was there. Okay, no. we sold at least two aprons. Yep, two aprons. We did have a T-shirt, but you gave it to someone in the pub. I did. I did. That'll be worth a lot, because that was a prototype as well. It was a misprint. It wasn't properly centred. But yeah, we got recognised in the pub. <laughs> It's a bit of a cheat because they kind of we knew did. who we were before, but we got, yeah, we got recognised in the pub. And we did the honourable thing. We took Charlie, our name was, and our friend, we took them out for drinks. And gave them a free t-shirt. Yeah, that you've just confessed to being wonky. No, a, bit, a, a first edition. That's going to be worth a fortune when we eventually become really famous. A factory reject. <laughs> Uh, Charlie was actually the one who did our fan art that we covered in one of the earlier episodes. She did the, she did the I'm Your Tongue Now fan art. There was somebody else, though. There was somebody on Twitter that was modelling one of the tote bags. Yes, yes, that's um, one of our artist friends. But she wore that tote bag to the Life in the Deep exhibit at Monterey Bay. So excellent cross-promotion there. That's ideal. Get more tote bags out there. It's <laughs> tote mean, by the way? Just to carry, I think. It's a lovely bag, though. It is. And you can get them from <laughs> our online shop. <laughs> You too could be the proud owner of a deep sea tote bag. Wear it with your apron. Yeah, that right. You could go down to the shops and get your baking products in your tote bag and bring them back and put on your deep sea podcast apron and make deep sea podcast cakes. The next one I'm probably going to do, because I've got the design sketched up for the I Am Your Tongue now, and that prints really well on a mask. So you could actually have a little parasitic isopod looking like it was sat on your tongue. That's gross, but yeah, yeah, on for that. Yeah, I'll probably like miss the zeitgeist to release a mask, eh? A year ago, that might have sold. Yeah, maybe <laughs> 18 months to two years ago, that would have been a great yeah. idea. Right, some fun news. There was some good stuff this month. There was a really nice Vox piece about Edith Witter to sort of promote her new book, Below the Edge of Darkness. Her main sort of career focus was to study animals without disturbing them. She's quoted as saying, we're, we're just so obtrusive. When we go down there with our big noisy thrusters and bright white lights, she thinks that even if the animals aren't actually removed from the area, they may not be showing natural behavior. It may impact their behavior. So she was really interested in observing animals without them knowing that we were there. Tricky thing to do. So she had an inspiration from the stoplight loose jaw, a particular type of fish that uses red bioluminescence which isn't very effective in the deep sea but it essentially means that it can illuminate its prey without them being able to detect it so inspired by that she created the eye in the sea which is a, a low light red light camera basically to hopefully film deep sea animals without even knowing that they're there one of the questions we get asked a lot whether the visible white lights disturbs the animals because we tend to pair up with sort of bait and using attracting scavenging animals basically their desire to eat a dead thing seems to overwhelm any sort of issue with their with their vision but if you wanted to look for some other behavior uh, then something that they're invisible to makes a lot of sense cool new underwater gps based on sound waves so the difficulty is as soon as you're below the surface a huge swath of the electromagnetic spectrum is just knocked out 
Uh, so you can't use GPS below the surface. You can't use a lot of things, basically. You have very little bandwidth once you're down there. Uh, so the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute wants to deploy sonic beacons, which can be used to triangulate tagged animals. Uh, and we've talked about the SOFAR channel in the past, the interesting sort of depth range where basically you can bounce sound down the thermocline, the density change in the deep sea. And that can transfer sounds from huge distances. So they're deploying these one-ton boys to make use of this SOFA channel and to create a sonic network, basically. So as opposed to sonar pings, they've dubbed these lower pitch bursts pongs. Lovely bit of alliteration there, but they can be received up to a thousand kilometers away. And there's plans to put two more boys out, which would cover the whole east coast of the United States as far as the Sagasso Sea. So great for tracking animals. They're sort of fixed points that you can then range. My little worry. If you're sort of inspired by whales and dolphins, surely this occupies the same frequency range and depth channel that these animals are. I would have hoped to thought about that. Yeah, I'm assuming who he is going to have considered disturbing marine mammals. But I thought this was interesting because it's very similar to how the sub navigated with its trio of landers that allows it to range and know its position based on them. Yes, yeah, seems sort of idea, doesn't it? Put something static on the seafloor and you can triangulate that. It doesn't move and then you the moving object, in this case the sub that runs through the middle of it, pings off those. It's a cool idea. Yeah, I'm curious to follow that because then once the network is in place, there's all sorts of like tags and underwater vehicles and gliders of things that can like make use of this. Speaking of navigation, what about the yellow brick road? If you follow the yellow brick road, you speak to the wizard. So... On one of the dive streams, so we talked about Nautilus Live on our dive streaming episode, and I said that incredible things can happen and you can have a front row seat for new discoveries. And one of them was the Yellow Brick Road. Exploring a deep sea ridge just north of Hawaii, about one kilometer depth, they found a patch of seabed that looks very much like a Yellow Brick Road. The volcanic rock is fractured in a way that looks strikingly similar to bricks. And it's likely the result of rapid heating and cooling from multiple eruptions over time at this margin. It does look like an archaeological dig, basically. It looks like an old Roman road. And they just came across it on the seabed. Very, very cool. Oh, don't tell the conspiracy theorists that. I, d- I did have that. a moment. I did have a look, oh, confirmed, confirmed. Yeah. Atlantis. It's now three nutcases we're dealing with at the same time. One of them's dangerous, one of them's a lunatic, and the other one, I'm, the jury is out. He's I'm, yet to become dangerous. I'm just, I'm just not <laughs> replying. He's yet to show his true colours, whether or not he's the dangerous ones or the loony tunes. There's a lot of retired gentlemen in America who think there's a really good idea to email me and accuse me of various things in the deep sea. What have you done now? Oh, this one relates back to the lost airliner again. Everyone seems to think I have a lost airliner and and why I'd (laughs) want to find it and not tell anyone. Yeah. Yeah, these people are absolutely bonkers. So don't tell them about Yellow Brick Road. Suddenly that will be a Roman road and it'll be some sort of lost city. NASA actually really struggles with this because they're so open. They share so much. You'd stare at enough barren sort of scenery and just like, that rock looks like a face. Well, yes, it does, because you've got a human brain that's desperately trying to pattern match. Like your brain is desperately trying to look for roads, doorways, faces, because that's what you've trained it to look for to survive. (laughs) It's not there. Or a canal system, which the canal is 11 kilometers wide by 1500 kilometers long. And it was just like dug out of the seafloor at four and a half thousand meters deep. Yeah, it's a lost city of Atlantis. What else could it have been? They had really big barges. On the live streams, there's also been a lovely sighting of the high fin dragonfish. Beautiful fish, though. Lovely bronze colour. So that mm. was one of the most striking features of it when seeing it live. And the team recording the animal thought that may be a useful trait to absorb bioluminescent light, masking it both from predators and its own prey. The dragonfish are a sneaky group. Within that family, we have some with the blackest blacks. We also have some with red bioluminescence that no other animals can see. That effectively gives them night vision over other animals even in the deep sea. So yeah, really interesting group of fish. And it's, again, lovely to see one not damaged and recovered, but swimming around. Where in the ocean does the dragonfish come from? What zone would you put that in? Well... I mean, they're not, they're, they're not benthic, are they? It's not. We, we're going to have to do a confession, because despite ranting and raving about how we're showing the deep sea as it really is, and we're removing all of the tropes, we are guilty of assuming that deep sea is a synonym for the bottom of the sea, where in fact... Most of the deep sea is open water, completely 3D environment. And by volume, that is by far the biggest proportion of habitat on the planet. So we've got to try and write that today, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to talk about the other bit. (laughs) The only reason why everyone, or including ourselves, always sort of thinks of deep sea as being the bottom is because the bottom is much easier to find. You can't miss it. (laughs) You can't miss it. It's really easy. Well, things like midwater trawling is really difficult because if you think about the depth in which you're trying to trawl at normally is a rule of thumb is like three times the water depth. 
is how much wire you have to pay out to tow something behind. So if you're towing it a thousand meters, you might have to put out three kilometers. But at the same time, you can't just put it three kilometers because it'll go straight down. So you have to tow it at a particular speed to get that thing to come back up to the desired depth. It's actually really difficult. Whereas if you're bottom trolling, you just need a big heavy auto troll, pay out loads of wire till it hits the bottom and then start dragging it. A controlled crash. So, you know, it's, it is difficult. And plus, the bottom is a two-dimensional plane. So if you're collecting samples on a two-dimensional plane, the density of material is much higher. Whereas if you've got in the midwater or the, the pelagic, the densities are so low, you can be towing for hours and still not get very much. Not to say that each and every sample isn't important, but you, you don't get a high quantity of stuff. And that's that's the problems of working up in that bit of the deep sea. But that dragonfish is a good example of what we're talking about ages ago about dark sea fish. Yeah. That, you know, the charismatic deep sea animals that get punted on TV documentaries are these big, crazy, scary looking black things with the fangs. That's, this is this is the realm in which we're going to talk about today. I think the other thing I'd like to, to jump in on though is just because it's, it's a shame when deep sea fish get misrepresented, but they're very rarely given us a scale. So you see all these horrible things with gnashing teeth, but uh, most of them are like the size of your thumb. And if I sort of talk to you about the the terrifying British woodlands, and I showed you like a really close up video of a frog swallowing a really big bug, or a dragonfly, like a real close up of its head, or a dragonfly nymph actually with the big extendable jaws like alien. I could make British wildlife look quite terrifying. There are a few, few big ones down there, but most of these things... You know, you could fit in the farm of your hand. Because yeah, that hyphen dragonfish in the Embari uh, news item, it was 16 centimetres. Mm. That's small. That's super small. But it's a beautiful animal. Yeah, we need to flip to this stuff's really, really cool rather than trying to make it terrifying because, yeah, most of these are the size of a dragonfly, which would be mm. terrifying if we filled them in the same way. We've clearly revealed our incompetence. We need to speak to someone who knows about this extra mysterious zone in the deep sea. Do you have anyone? I know a guy. You know a guy? I think I know a guy. I know a guy. He's a very funny guy. We should give him a call. Get the phone. We'll call the guy. Today we have Tracy Sutton, who's a renowned ichthyologist from Nova Southeastern University in Florida, and an all-round nice bloke and inspiring storyteller. But my reckoning over the course of my career, Tracy, you and I have met somewhere, I think, on average every five years. Yeah. <laughs> and every time we do, it's really good fun. That so, Tracy, right. welcome to Deep Sea Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That's all right. So, I think for the benefit of the, of the audience, I don't know, we're up to episode 24 now, I think. We spoke a lot. We haven't touched the pelagic very much. When we talk about the epipelagic and the mesopelagic, what are we talking about? Uh, well, actually, it's a relatively common phenomenon in deep sea science. It seems to mostly revolve around the sea floor. So uh, we're, we're kind of used to being the odd person out a little bit. But in terms of the pelagic environment, we basically divide it up by light penetration since we don't have any cool benthic features to define our habitat. So we just couch most things in terms of light. So epipelagic is where you have enough light for photosynthesis. We tend to use uh, 200 meters as this magic point, but lately we're finding out it varies fairly widely depending on where you are. Wherever light is 1% of the surface, maybe is the bottom of the epipelagic and then the mesopelagic, people have taken and calling it the twilight zone again because it sounds cool. I don't like that. I know. It's, <laughs> it, it seems to be getting a little tired, to be honest. I mean, I, I think the twilight zone kind of makes sense because it is kind of twilighty. The one that annoys me is the midnight zone. That just makes my blood boil. It's so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that we're trying to portray what we do to the average person. So we have to use whatever we can to kind of relate. So... Yeah, that twilight zone, I guess that's as good as any, even though the whole thing is we tend to classify organisms as epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic. But, you know, the more we really look and, and think about it and, and see how connected it all is, that's really just the daytime picture. So it, it almost is worth that kind of addendum. Every time you say mesopelagic, you just say during the day, because at night, you know, it just is full of mesopelagic so it's funny because tom and i were talking about this just moments ago before you came on about about the pelagic and then how we do the deep sea and injustice quite often like you say because we, we're used to sort of thinking about it in terms of a two-dimensional seafloor yeah and i guess it's because it's, it's sampling wise it's much easier to find the seafloor than it is to find 
mid-water, if you know what I mean. You know, trawling, for example, you just throw a big heavy trawl net down and you drag it along the bottom and pull it back up. But flying trawls mid-water is, is quite a skill in itself. But yeah. the, what gets me about the pelagic and the mesopelagic and the twilight zone and all that is the scale, right? So let's talk about mesopelagic fish. I know you have some big numbers here in terms of diversity, biomass, you know, how those compare to commercial fish species, because the mesopelagics are not fish that normal people would have probably come across and perhaps don't appreciate just how huge these populations are. Exactly right. You know, and a lot of it is based on our biases of how we sample it. We want to know what's there. So we tow a midwater trawl, but then we find that things are pretty good at avoiding that. So we, we look at it with acoustics and then we see the scale of the avoidance but the acoustics don't tell you what it is. They're just bright colors and pretty pictures. Mm. So so then we send down uh, cameras and do some optical observation. And then we see, oh, all these jellyfish and all these things we don't catch with nets or see with acoustics. But then you're just looking through a keyhole at this tiny little volume. So it's very difficult to come up with any meaningful numbers. It's almost like use every technique you can get and take the highest number you can get, and then that's still probably less than what's out there kind of thing. The revelation that uh, Tony Koslow and Stein Karpvet and pe people like that, they really came to show us how underestimating of biomass we, we really are. So now we know that the biomass of fishes in the mesopelagic zone is one to maybe up to three orders of magnitude higher than all of the commercial fish landings globally every year. It's, it's a lot of biomass. It's, it's pretty widely dispersed and all, but that's still not stopping some entities from wanting to commercially fish it, you know, because, oh, there's a lot of biomass. Let's go get it. To illustrate that whole thing about such a huge mass of animals that migrate up to the surface at night and back down during the day, that if you think about those spread across the entire Pacific Ocean, and the Pacific is half the planet. By the time the, the sun's gone down on one side, the sun's coming back up on the other side. So you have this huge undulating vertical migration, which never stops. It must be going on 24-7, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, half the planet, half the time is undergoing a vertical migration just in the Pacific. So the amount of carbon going up and down is just immense, and then when you add the human element, it's very difficult to tell people why they should care about these hmm. creatures. Most people, you know, can we eat it? No, then we don't care. But <laughs> but the, all that carbon, taking carbon out of the atmosphere through the pump, then people start, oh, okay. And I've seen estimates of the monetary value of that service, hundreds of billions of U.S. dollars up to trillions is the estimate of its monetary wow. value of that. Who are the, the main players in this then? Is it the McTophids or is there a few sort of big families in there? We just finished a carbon export model in the Gulf of Mexico and, and found out that, yeah, it's this family of fishes, the lanner fishes, are the major players. They're not the most abundant midwater fish. That belongs to this little ridiculous looking thing called a cyclothony, which basically kind of looks <laughs> like a worm with two eyeballs and it vaguely resembles a fish. But, you know, there's just these mind boggling numbers of cyclothony, maybe more than all other vertebrates combined, including all other fish. But the lantern fishes, they're the real carbon engine, if you will. Over half the carbon export by fishes seems to be done by these lantern fishes. So they're, they're kind of the anchovies of the open ocean. Everything eats them. So if you do something really bad in this lifetime, you come back as a lantern fish and you're next. Because <laughs> if you're in the open ocean and you're a lantern fish, you're not going to die of old age. That's pretty much the way that's yeah, going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to enjoy your life while you enjoy can. Enjoy it. Yeah. Doing some research for this episode, I had to look at your website and I, I strongly recommend everybody goes and Googles Tracy Sutton's lab and have a look at the deep sea fish pictures. Yeah. They're absolutely phenomenal. You'll see a whole wonderful range of what I can only describe as morphological madness, which is one of the really interesting things about these mesopelagic fish is just how unbelievably complex and diverse and strange and intriguing these things really are. Are there typical traits of a mesopelagic fish or is it just an absolute free-for-all? There are a couple of characteristics most of them have, which is some form of lights along their belly. Most midwater fish are aligned that way, hypothetically, to counter shade from below, hide their own shadow. But then it really just blows up. You really see almost the largest gamut of vertebrate diversity that there is. You see 
tiny, tiny little eyes or some of the largest eyes per vertebrate size of any animal. And then you see no teeth or some of the biggest teeth, again, that a vertebrate possesses. <laughs> just, just Some fish have teeth so big when they close their mouth, they have to look through their teeth. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, quite frankly. And then the lures that some of them have, again, the diversity is mind-boggling. I've got a taxonomic key for one genus of dragonfish And that key is 195 pages long for just one genus. And it's all based on this radical diversity of the lure that hangs off their chin. It's just nuts. It's like speciation just run wild, you know. Um, This is it, yeah. So, so, I mean, every every time you go out, for example, trawling in the Gulf of Mexico, are you still, even after, what, 10, 12 years of of this program you're on just now, are you still pulling up new species quite regularly? Oh, yeah. No, we see something new on every cruise still at this time. Nice. We're sampling below a thousand meters. So once you get below there, you don't catch as much, but just the diversity is mind boggling. So we generally get something that we haven't seen before. And in many cases, it's new world's ninth largest water body. And we're still seeing new fish every cruise. It's it's nuts. What blew me away about your stuff was that I always assumed that deep mesopelagic fish were all deep sea fish. And you were saying that actually, if you go out and look hard enough, you'll find reef fish out there. Yeah. You'll find all these other dudes who are not supposed to be there are all out there in open ocean, midwater, which I just find mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For all the world, they look like pelagic fish until they, I guess, decide it's time to go be a reef fish or whatever. Squirrel fish are blue and silver and they they form little squadrons. And a certain fish, juvenile, looks just like a hatchet fish and kind of acts like it too. So it's really quite fascinating. But then when you think about the reef environment, they change on these thousands to tens of thousands of year cycles. They change with sea level rise and even the old coral reefs are not very old, thousands of years. These species are millions of years old. It's like the open ocean is the constant and it has this pool of juveniles ready to recolonize the coastal zone if something really goes badly and it, everything gets wiped out. There's a pool of recruits right there out in the open ocean. That's fascinating. So are they, are they, are they at the same depth when the, the time comes to move to the reef? Do they just swim to the shore or do they go right down deep in the midwater? Good question. No, they're mostly up. So they're mostly up in the top 200 meters where the plankton still go. But again, we see things like scorpion fishes. Half of our trawls we catch as scorpion fish. That's the same frequency of occurrence of, of a lot of lantern fish, you know. So it's not like they're just mistakenly out there. And they're not in huge numbers, but they're really quite frequent. You catch one or two in almost every trawl. So then you do a quick amount of math and you realize that there's more biomass of these reef fish out there as juveniles than there is as adults on these reefs. You could properly <laughs> say that these are pelagic fish with an adult benthic phase instead of the other way around. It's, yeah. it's, it's kind of weird when you think about it like that. So with that, that in mind, honing in on the, the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, you're, you, you lead the deep end consortium and that is huge. We're in our 11th year now. It started right after the Deepwater Horizon disaster where Noah, who was charged of assessing the damage, the natural resource damage, realized that they didn't have any available information to do that. So we started sampling and then over time, we've been able to keep it going through various iterations and different funding agencies because the time series of any pelagic area anywhere, those are just really, really rare. So we're glad we've been able to keep it going. Like you said, it's one thing to go to a spot on the bottom because you know right where it is. But in the pelagic, you know, we deal in time as much as we deal in space. So you have to go out a lot and sample a lot before it makes any sense at all. Otherwise, it, it seems chaotic. Well, yeah, plus you've got day-night cycles in there, probably monthly, yeah, and yeah, yeah, interannual. When, and... Yeah, when something moves up at night, it's in a different water mass that could be going in a completely different direction. So you literally can just sit at one spot in the ocean and no two samples are the same. It's kind of like, <laughs> say you never stick your toe in the same river twice. It's very much like that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you telling me that, or presenting a conference about some of these mesopelagic fish that, that migrate up and down. They don't move laterally very much. I'm sure you showed some acoustic data that showed that when you trawl through it, you're basically taking all the fish up a big long corridor. And then you come back the next day and you can still see that corridor of 
no fish. Sign card fed really showed that very well off Norway, where you see kind of a halo effect when you tow a trawl through a, a nice big mm. shoal of fish. You see that kind of vacuum. You see that for hours. You know, they they, they move yeah. over, but they don't really move back in. With us, the Gulf of Mexico is fairly physically dynamic. So we have the Gulf's iteration of the Gulf Stream, the loop current, and, and that usually keeps things pretty well stirred. So chances are that it, things would get backfilled in a place like that fairly quickly. And again, what, what we know about the lateral movements really isn't much. In some places like Hawaii, Kelly Benoit Bird showed that the lander fish actually migrate up into shallow water and then back out. So they actually do have this kind of horizontal component to their movement, but we don't have that kind of precision of estimates offshore. So we don't know really. Right. We just assume they're moving up and down because the advection due to the physics of the water is so great that they would have a hard time really keeping their station horizontally. A day in the life of a McTofid is probably pretty boring. Yeah, hypothetically, they swim down deep and just kind of take a nap. Do they actually swim down or do they just sort of adjust their buoyancy? No, they, sw- they swim. They, they're, they're speed. They? Yeah, and it's actually a very organized up and down. So we've seen this a few times and all the acousticians have seen this, that you have this deep scattering layer during the day. When it comes up, it doesn't do it all at once. It often comes up in waves or sheets, if you will, and you'll have things that will take off and start migrating first and get up there super fast. And then you've got another layer that's a little slower. And then when they go down, it's not quite the same, but it's organized and it's repetitive. So you actually, it's what seems chaotic is actually a pretty synchronized. There's a lot of pattern to it. Once you really hone in with high resolution data, there's a lot of behavior there that we're just beginning to understand. That's fascinating. Well, staying in the Gulf of Mexico, we're going back to Deepwater Horizon. What's what's the what's the latest on that? We don't really hear about it much anymore. Well, you know how the news cycles are. There's there's just been so much going on that it, we don't really have a lot of windows without a calamitous event these days. It seems like so. <laughs> uh, yeah, people have forgotten about Deepwater, and a lot of people just assume it's over. So we just completed a synthesis of the Deepwater Horizon, a decade of research kind of a thing. We put together what we figured was the best information about its effect. And the effect was very taxon specific. Some things like phytoplankton and zooplankton rebounded very, very quickly. And then some things were able to avoid it, perhaps. And then it seems to be the middle trophic level. So basically the mesopelagic fishes, shrimps and squids we're talking about seem to have taken the worst of it offshore. Right now, we have no data to suggest that it's over. As far as we know, yeah, there's still oil out there. And as of our last analysis of tissues, 2018, so three and a half years ago or whatever, there was still... Uh, levels of PAH is this kind of toxic component of oil that were above sublethal in fish gonads. So it's wow. yeah, it's it's still a persistent thing. Yeah, that's amazing. People have stopped talking about it when it's clearly still such a big issue. Yeah, well, and it's also not the last oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. There have been some since Deepwater Horizon. So it <laughs> it takes a lot to crack the news cycle these days when you've got wars yeah. and global pandemics and whatnot. So it's, that's probably the most tragic thing. It's probably more tragic than the Deepwater Horizon, the fact that that's not, not considered to be interesting enough to make the it news. Takes, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 takes, it takes something pretty horrible now to really lead the news cycle. Yeah. Let's go to more interesting yeah. places then, right? So let's yeah. think about what happens if you go deeper. The abyssal pelagic, the hadal pelagic. I've come across this recently because we're putting together this new trench thing and everything else. And one thing that we've never looked at is the hadal pelagic. And I went back into the literature and I found one paper from 1960 with vertical trawls of plankton Ooh. by the, the Russians. Okay, yeah. And that is it. Okay. That is it. I often wondered that when in search for the deepest living fish, you know, as everybody's looking at the bottom, maybe there's a cyclothony that drifted right over your head. It was like, it, there it was. <laughs> <laughs> just <went> over. <laughs> It's just a very difficult thing to think about. In the submarine, we the way in which our sub is designed, it's designed to, to get down to the depths very quickly because they're so deep. If you did a normal sub design, it would take like eight hours or something. So, but when, so when, you're, when you're piling through the Hadal Pelagic at whatever 
speed we're doing. There's loads of stuff in the water column ah, all the way. Yeah. But we never, it's, it's too, I've never seen anything big. Right. But there's certainly stuff constantly going there. I mean, I was starting to think maybe we should start to stop, maybe at the end and just hang for a bit. Yeah. Because trawling, midwater trawling at like 9,000 meters is going to be uh, quite challenging, I would have thought, for probably yeah. everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. just wondering whether there would be even, is there any reason to believe there would be stuff? that down deep mid water would there be enough food to support that there would be if you had a lifestyle that allowed you to go a long time between meals so again as, yeah. as we're thinking about something like a bristle mouth usually uh less than 10 percent of anything you catch has food in its stomach so it seems like it's it's a thing that's used to not eating much or it doesn't require much so that would be the trick there would have to be something that was uh had such a low metabolic demand that a meal once in a blue moon would do it. Yeah. But I, I do think there are um, amphipods and, and there are candidate things down there that theoretically, if you could eat it and not be eaten by it, then it could sustain you for quite a while, hypothetically. Yeah. yeah. Trying to put together a hedoplagic project could be one of the most interesting things we ever do, or the single dullest thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it's it's going to be one of the two, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it will be. Yeah. Four years just staring into yeah. darkness and just going, oh, well, there's yeah. nothing here. Well, we, we, we did, uh, we towed down to 5,000 meters in the Sargasso. By we, I really mm. mean Peter Wiebe and Larry Maiden and Buckland. I was the token fish person because it was a plankton project. We actually did find stuff close to the bottom ish, you know, within a couple hundred meters of the bottom. But that that area between 2000 and about 4500 was kind of a ghost town. One of the things I think what people like to hear about when you when you're a scientist who works with nature and, and animals in particular is, and I'm going to change this standard question, a lot of people ask, what's your favorite one, but I think the types of animals you work with is not so much what's your favorite is what is the most ridiculous fish that you get down there? Because I know, having looked at your website, there are some real beauties in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, there there are some some absolutely ridiculous fish, especially amongst the angler fishes. You know, you just look at them and you think this fish had to have been invented while someone was on just a terrible acid trip or something like that. Because <laughs> you just think, what happened here? It's just, it's all mouth. And then maybe a little fin in the back and, and a couple of useless eyeballs. And then it's got warts or fin elements flying out in all directions. And you just think, this is just a bad dream. And then you realize that fish mathematically may not see another of its own species in its lifetime. So now you've got this wow. ridiculous looking fish bobbing around, basically adapted for utter loneliness with little, <laughs> little or no chance of ever meeting the one so what a so what you're saying is it's ugly on the inside and the outside I know. It's, it's probably bitter you know in addition to looking ridiculous it's probably bitter the entire time so there, there it I is i guess it's one of those things that if evolution had a conscience they would probably not think that anyone's ever going to see these things so they just put them underwater and said like okay i that was not the greatest fish I've ever come up with, but it's okay. We'll bury it around a thousand meters. No one will ever see it. Yeah, yeah. And then, boom, there it is on the internet. Yeah, the, the poor cosmic <laughs> joke come to roost. You have to feel for animals like that. It, it's not like what makes you get up in the morning because you don't get a morning, but you just think, that fish could think. Yeah. What is it thinking all day long? Yeah. If you could give that fish a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would just explode. It screams yeah. from the mesopelagic. It would just explode. Just, it looked like that. <laughs> yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Tracy, thanks very much for joining us today. That's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, it has been a good time. Immediately after recording that interview, you went for a joyride. I did. So I don't think we mentioned this in the interview, but that interview I did from quarantine on my own in a very, very beautiful villa on the coral reefs of Tahiti, overlooking the beautiful volcano of Morea. It was funny because we were sitting there talking to Tracy about, you know, the twilight zone and mesopelagic and the use of light and vertical migration, all this kind of stuff. I mean, the reasons I was in Tahiti were, we'll explain in another podcast, but there were a lot of ships in the area, you know, science vessels and so on. And I had a jetty. This is the most James Bond thing I've ever done. I had my own jetty in my quarantine and then a ship came along and waited outside of the coral reef and sent a tender in to pick me up. And I, I left the villa by the sea. You know, that was so cool. And I got in the tender, went out to the ship. That wasn't the ship I was staying on, but it was one of the ships that's got a on it. So I walked into the ship and the guy was like, hey, how's it going? One of your friends is here. I'm like, oh yeah, who's that? And he says, Patrick Lai. 
remember Patrick Lai from Triton Subs. He was on the podcast a while back. On the sub episode. Patrick's on the ship. And we're just like, yeah, 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 chatting away and everything else. And he was about to do what's called a checkout dive with this pilot, a checkout dive. It's like a driving test, I guess. So we took the ship around the other side of Maria. This particular sub is a Triton sub and it's a three-seater. And he says, do you want to jump in? Oh like, yeah, sure, whatever. Those subs are ones with a big acrylic ball, or not like our sub, where it's kind of crazy and you've got to wear the right jumpsuits and all the rest of it. This is very much a tourist submarine. It's like, yeah, all right. So I just kicked my shoes off and jumped in a tender and went out and jumped in the sub. Yeah, this is literally like three days after speaking to Tracy. We just did a dive to 550 meters, straight down. You went to visit? Yeah, it was amazing. It was just amazing having it. You could see all the little siphonophores in the water and jellies and all this stuff kicking around and little fish here and there. But what struck me is, when we're talking about the low light levels and stuff like that, I just always assumed at 500 meters it will be dark. I mean, there's probably light there which is relevant to animals with sensitive low light vision or whatever it is. But fair enough, the visibility in Tahiti is amazing. And it was in the middle of the day, so the sun was pretty strong. But we got down to 500 meters and the guy was like, check this out. And switched all the lights off in the sub, every single light. You could still see the seafloor. You could still see fish swimming around at 500 meters just from the light That's of the sun. I just thought that was really cool. And it was the first time I've been in one of those subs with a full 360 vision. And it was just, it was amazing because I'm just like, this is exactly what Tracy was talking about, this. It was just it's such really a cool exciting. surprise. Yeah, it really was. And I was totally recommend it. And then I was taught how to scuba dive, just for fun. So I went scuba diving, Tom. Well, that's another funny story because there was the person involved in this new project. She's a dive master and she was like, oh, we're going to go scuba diving. And I think myself and John, who designed the deepest submersible in the world and Heather Stewart who's also been on the show she's the deepest diving British women and all that kind of stuff none of us had ever been scuba diving <laughs> all the people that you'd really assume did yeah this one was like well, that's it you're all getting in the water I can't have that. I'm going to teach all of you and then she goes through the training on the ship she's like you know pressure does this pressure does that that's it and it's like no nah, no nah, we're good for that bit and that was really cool actually I mean, we've got a nice photograph of the three of us on a coral reef in a place called Fakarava apparently one of the best dive sites in the world it's a coral atoll in the middle of nowhere hundreds of miles east of Tahiti. No other diving is going to compete now. So the one time you dove, it was like the best dive in the world. <laughs> you can just put it to bed now. It's done. Just beautiful, unspoiled coral reefs. That's mad. I've never been in that top before. <laughs> it's quite nice. Because <laughs> it goes so deep, you have to leave the surface really fast. So even the top thousand meters, we just rock it through that in about 10 minutes, if not less. Certainly top 500 meters, you're probably going through that in about three or four minutes or something like that. So it was nice to actually like do some scuba diving and doing some 500 meter dives yeah. and just... Oh, I can see why all these other marine biologists quite like this. Yeah, it's quite pretty. <laughs> yeah, there's way more going on in the top than there's in the bottom, eh? It'd be way easier to study that. Way easier. But the way I've figured out, there's so much going on in the top, you can't study the top without knowing loads about statistics. And that just, to me, sounds like hard sums. So if you go down deep, there's only like two of everything. So there's yeah. no point doing any stats. You get to write a whole paper on three replicates. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm fine with that. The whole thing was very cool. Oh, I'm glad you got diving. That's great. But anyway, where, where, where we're talking about all this, have you ever read Rainbow Fish? Oh, the kids' book. I may go down a tangent here, but do with kids' books, right? Remember Prema, who read out the Blobfish poem and a few a few podcasts ago? Yes. She gave me a new Rainbow Fish book, and it's called Rainbow Fish Discovers the Deep Sea. Oh. So my son's reading it. Can he give us a review? Well, I don't like Rainbow Fish himself, <laughs> but I think some of the animals he meets on the way are pretty cool. But I don't like Rainbow Fish, but I just don't trust them. You know what I mean? There's something about protagonists and kids' stuff that's just, just a bit unnerving. Well, it's a bit like Postman Pat. It seems to be the cause and solution to all the problems. He's engineering a problem so they can sell the solution. He's a capitalist monster. Don't try and pass yourself <laughs> off as a hero at the end, because it was you that started yeah. it. So the very last paragraph, I think, is relevant to Deep Sea, and it's relevant to what we're talking about with Tracy. So basically, as you can imagine, Rainbow Fish does sound stupid and ends up going to Deep Sea. And of course, the Deep Sea guys have to like bail him out because he's daft. Anyway, so the last paragraph is, the little blue fish and all his other friends were waiting to welcome Rainbow Fish home. Everybody wanted to know what it was like down in the depths. Was it scary, they asked. Were the creatures awful? No, said Rainbow Fish. They were beautiful. They looked different, but they turned out to be wonderful friends just like you. Oh, I think that's great. The last page, he gets destroyed by a tiger shark. Does he? No. No. <laughs> This is like the Hello Kitty of the sea. They're not going to kill off Rainbow Fish. In all fairness, though, there's another book I'd like to mention. It came to my attention in Tahiti as well. A book that my six-year-old son took out of his school library. I've never heard of it before. It's called Deep Dive into Deep Sea by Tim Flannery, who's apparently a big Aussie professor dude. And his artwork by Sam Caldwell, right? And it's brilliant. Remember, we're always talking about the Mariana snailfish, which is actually the Atacama snailfish, that famous photograph we took in 2010. It appears on the cover in cartoon form. So I was like, ooh, that's interesting. The illustrations inside are amazing. And the reason why he sent it to me was because myself, I mentioned in it, as is Patrick, as in John, who I've just been talking about. Oh, cool. Which is kind of cool. 
but it's the first kids book kids books are normally about you know i'm not exactly the target audience but you're sitting there going that's not true that's not true but this one's got everything in it it's, it's got the, the trenches the snailfish it's got super giants in it it's got animals with plastic in their guts like plasticus it's beautiful and it's actually like really well researched and really beautifully illustrated and it, it gives the deepest parts of the ocean as much attention as the rest of it which is kind of unique i'll include a link to this it's the first time i've actually sat and read it because i was genuinely like this is cool as it genuinely came from my son who was like hey you're in this book i'm like what book give me that <laughs> <laughs> you're all geared up to like tear it apart and you're just like oh i just enjoyed a kid's book about my field. Yeah, it's got the mirror belly spookfish in there, the Ellsman whip nose, the gulper eel, the cookie cutter shark, you know, the lantern sharks. It even goes into the fact that the original supergiant was described from skeletal remains that were picked from an albatross's vomit on a pier in Hawaii. Actually, on the back cover, it's got a cartoon of the albatross being sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Okay, this is an official yeah. recommendation then. That's really cute. That's the children's corner. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Recommendations. Hello. No one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. Hello, my name is Henry. I'm a second year student at the University of British Columbia studying English language and literature. I'm also trying to do some science communication as a hobby. And I recently read a paper from the 1980s that describes vertical migrating fishes in the surface pelagic as nito epipelagic. Nito in Latin has a few meanings such as make effort, but I think they meant to use a translation of blink or wink, which would basically make the term nito epipelagic translate to the blink upon the open sea, because fishes are migrating from the bright euphotic zone to the dark dysphotic zone. Personally, I think that sounds pretty cool, but it didn't seem to catch on and unfortunately faded away in 2006. So I was wondering if you guys at the Deep Sea Podcast knew any more interesting etymology to share regarding the Deep Sea. Anyways, thank you for the awesome content, Tom and Alan. Keep it up. I had a little dig myself and I could find it being used in 2021 in a paper on growth patterns of lanternfish in the Western Mediterranean, but the listener was absolutely right. It does seem to have disappeared. I got back in touch with Tracy. He informed us that it's a Russian term, so it's often spelt with a, a Y instead of an I for the, the Nikto part. Uh, and he doesn't know why the usage has declined uh, because he thinks it's an important... It's a great word, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. It, it, Nictoepipelagic. It, yeah, it's, it's lovely in its meaning and in sort of the way it's constructed. But he thought that was, was an important word because it's an important distinction to delineate between basically what we call most mesopelagic fish are only there for half of the day. So you could just as easily call them hmm. epipelagic fish that swim down to the mesopelagic during the daytime. So he... he wanted that term to reappear really because it's a more accurate description of these fish that... let's bring it back tom yeah all right okay it's official now nictoepipelagic nictoepipelagic so get it in your papers i know a lot of scientists listen i don't know why <laughs> but get it in your papers bring it back uh there was another nice accidental bit of entomology we were chatting recently i was chatting with one of your students about the little sharks that we saw in the red sea little scamps here they're like oh, little terriers cheeky wee fellas but very good at living in low oxygen and they are from the genus iago uh or i think it might be pronounced iago but it's the villain in shakespeare's othello and that's because members of this genus have been troublemakers for systematics. So they're viewed as a kind of villain. Nice. We were having trouble figuring out which species it was or whether there was multiple species there. So it's interesting that they're actually a villainous genus in terms of systematics because it's difficult to place them. Cool bit of entomology there. The species is Omanensis, isn't it? Yeah, as named after Oman. Oman. No, they are little scamps. A lot of personality. They're good little snuffly fellas. Well, when they come to the bait of camera, they take the bait like you'd imagine a terrier takes grandpa's slipper. <laughs> Just goes, <grrr. laughs> I like the name because it's memorable, but I don't like it when the animal is punished for our own shortcomings, if that makes sense. That's a really cool yeah. animal. It's not, it's not their fault. They don't have to be easy for us. This is humanity trying to put them in boxes. Do you think maybe, Tom, you're overthinking this a little bit? <laughs> I just, you know, I don't like fish being bullied. I think it's mean. <laughs> you just got you got to call them something, right? I know. We can't touch upon any element of oceanography without it turning out that Don had a hand in its early days. So while we're on the mesopelagic, Don has a great story about the early days of studying the deep scattering layer before we even knew what it was. Hello, this is uh, oceanographer, explorer Don Walsh. 
And I've got another sea story for you. I like to call this one the elusive deep scattering layer. But first, a disclaimer. I am not a marine biologist. While I am trained as an oceanographer, that was my particular field. So I'm going to try to explain this biological phenomenon in lay terms because that's the best I can do. Well, what is the deep scattering layer, the DSL, and how was it first detected? In World War II, uh, sonar operators looking for submarines and also trying to map the seafloor saw false indications of a seafloor and shoal condition, and perhaps even submarines that seem to be appearing in places where they shouldn't be. Then they noticed that there was a daily vertical migration of this shallow area, so that some theorized, well, perhaps it's just a dense layer made up of millions of animals, because seafloor doesn't move up and down very much, except if you're over an earthquake. And another clue was the fact that this layer seemed to have a daily vertical migration. And it wasn't until the late 1960s that Dr. Eric Barham of San Diego State University and the Navy Electronics Laboratory in San Diego decided to go out and use manned submersibles to actually visit the DSL and find out who lived there. From earlier work, it was estimated that the daytime depth of the DSL would be near the surface, and at nighttime it could be as deep as 1,600 feet. Well, I took him on his first dive in the Bathyscaphe Trieste, and it was in 1962. And we dove at the San Diego trough just offshore from San Diego down to the seafloor at about 4,000 feet. Our dive would take us through the water column from the surface to the seafloor to see those critters, if they were indeed critters, at their daytime deepest depths. We had a research vessel from Scripps Oceanographic Institution with us, and it would use its sonar to acoustically see both the R submersible and the scattering layer at the same time. And also it would collect physical specimens. Sadly, we never saw the deep scattering layer. The surface sonar on, on the uh, research ship showed that the critters made a hole as we passed right through them. And they also had no luck in collecting specimens that day. So it was not a good day for science, perhaps. Now, scientists have found that some grouped organisms have a pre-warning response to outside threats and can move to avoid them. And I believe that's what happened to us. So did our work that day do anything to help address the mysteries of the deep scattering layer? The mystery remained that if it was plankton, then what types were they? However, we did find that to be such hardy targets, it was clear that they must have had large swim bladders, so that is, encapsulating bubbles of air, which made hard sonar responses. These are needed to address their buoyancy for their daily migration up and down in the water column. It was especially hard work for them coming up because they had to inflate those internal balloons in their body each day. Imagine you trying to blow up a balloon each day that was capable of lifting you up into the air. A lot of hard work used up a lot of their energy. And also the vertical migrations were diurnal, that is daily. They responded to the intensity of light. But why do they do all that work? Well, there are two reasons. To feed, because the promising food sources would be near the surface, and also to avoid predators. At nighttime, predators that rely on sight to catch their prey were uh, going to have a more difficult time finding these small critters. Well, Eric Barb was able to... uh, continue his work using manned submersibles, both the Bathyscaphe Trieste and the Cousteau-designed diving saucer. He finally saw the critters, uh, which turned out to be small lanternfish and gelatinous siphonophores. He found the relatively large swim bladders actually gave the acoustic results associated with hard target data, such as the false seafloor. Since those early researches a half century ago, Much more has been done on the deep scattering layer. Better sonars, physical sampling, more researchers getting involved, and they have helped answer many of the questions or mysteries of this DSL. So was Professor Barham's first dive a failed expedition? I think no, because if you don't look for something, you will never find anything. And he kept trying in the years after our first dive and was eventually successful. But remember, sometimes even a negative outcome can become useful data in its own right. Well, that's all for now, and thanks for listening. 
another listener question was actually from James McLean, fish expert at the Natural History Museum. And he was giving a talk on the deep sea. One of the best parts about talking to the general public about the deep sea is actually they ask some of the best questions and they really get us thinking about things in different ways. One of the really great questions he got from his audience was how parasites and diseases spread among deep sea fishes when they're so sparse, when they're so spread out. And a lot of parasites seem so species specific, basically, like their life cycle might require three different, incredibly specific species. And how can you guarantee that you're going to move through the animals that you need to in order to complete your life cycle? So are they more generalist? Are they not specific as we see in other areas? Or are they finding a way to somehow cope? Because we certainly do see, we see a lot of parasites in in deep sea fish. I think the, the chimera is the one that I always think of because they always, always have that mm. copepod in the corner of their eyes. And unfortunately for the fellas, quite often on the claspers as well. But are they, do, are they doing any harm to the chimera though? Because they're always there, but the chimeras don't look like they really care. It looks like they're just wearing earrings, but the earrings have been pierced <laughs> through their eyes. And it doesn't seem to deteriorate the eye. The eye seems to be functional. Uh. I know those two those two things you see sort of hanging off of often are the, are the gonads. I'm not sure if this is the final phase or... I don't think it's just using the chimera for structure. I think it is actually feeding off it, but it seems to be... I mean, they, they all have them. So it's obviously like a relationship that goes way back between these two species. So maybe uh, maybe they're sort of equally good at coping with them. For the show notes, I'll give you uh, some pictures of some Coryphenoides armatus from 5,000 metres in Antarctica. Right. You always think, ah, oh, nice clean place, all the fish down there will be all lovely and nice. Yeah, they've got stuff hanging off them, but it's not good. It's not pretty. I'll put them in the show notes. You can all, you can all just get a good look at what a deep sea parasite <laughs> looks like. I've certainly found worms when opening them up. I remember finding a really big yeah. worm in a spectrunculus. But interesting that like a globally distributed species, you seem to find like parasite hotspots because we had the mystery of, of that fungus that a few of us realised we'd been seeing. Yeah. It's like fluffy... I mean, back to the old fish keeping days, it looked like a secondary fungal infection on a bacterial ulcer. If any aquarists are like, oh, yes, I can imagine what that looks like. And it tended to be on the base of the dorsal fin. But sometimes it was like wrapping right around the side of the body. And it only yeah. seemed to be in certain areas. But quite a lot of the fish had this. That kind of fizzled out, didn't it? We we managed to track down somebody who had a specimen of it. And we were going to look look and figure out what that was well we weren't no it was a classic case of i think we all put our heads together and found someone who knows how to analyze it and give it to them and they put it in the freezer and that was it that's how most of science dies <laughs> yeah huh. uh that's quite very disappointing in the end that was quite weird that one because sometimes it was just like a it just looked like a fungus around the dorsal fin there was other ones we looked at off the congo that looked like they had uh pock marks remember mm. the one that it looked like it had pox yeah that was pretty gross but it was just one fish. It was just one out of potentially hundreds of fish, and it just seemed to be completely infected with something. It looked a lot like carp uh, Quite often you see they've got one or two, but this one just had like hundreds. It was gross. It looked really uncomfortable. In the Bay of Biscay, I was seeing a lot of sort of benthic species you tend to see, the, the antimora and the moras and things like that, the fork beards and things like that, fish that, that you see a lot, but they all had dappled black markings on them. So I'm not sure if that was something parasite base that was mm. giving them these spots or whether it was like local color morphs but it's yeah really weird like fish that i'm really familiar with i'm just like hey it's you but it's like a spotty version like like special pokemon variants but then i suppose if you're a scavenger fish the way to transmit disease is to turn up at a food fall when you go into these big feeding boats that's where you're going to be in close contact with the rest of them right well that would be interesting if then there's a, a surface linkage is there a whale parasite that completes its life cycle in a deep sea fish deep sea scavenging animal because the chances are that's where the carcass is going to end up i think we're going to have to find a deep sea parasitologist we do it's i used to know one i used to when i very very first started going to sea i think it might it may have only been on my first cruise maybe the first two there was a guy called rod bray he was a deep sea parasitologist he was picking stuff out of all sorts of orifices <laughs> he was pulling animals out of other animals left and right finally we haven't heard from larkin in a while and that's because she's been off on a new adventure so i'll let her fill us in on what she's been up to and where she is right now 
Hey everyone, Larkin here, your salty sailor correspondent, reporting from the Gulf of Mexico on board my new research vessel, the RV Pelican, straight out of Louisiana. First off, I gotta say, I thought I had experienced some rough seas coming from my background. I've been on ships from Alaska to Norway to Hawaii, but my first night on board the Pelican, I quickly found out why they call the Gulf of Mexico the washing machine. And it's not to be taken lightly. In fact, I am swaying back and forth right now as I'm trying to record this. So if it's a little choppy, uh, I apologize. It's just the seas that we are in right now. I've also met some amazing sailors from the bayou. They truly have the soul of the water running through their veins, and I've already learned so much from these hilarious, super salty sailors. Okay, it's time to get back to work. We're pulling a weather buoy on board for repairs, which I am, of course, recording for my YouTube channel. Head over to my Salty Sea Life on YouTube, Instagram to see the latest videos. Until next time, stay salty out there. I thought we might start covering a little bit of deep sea and pop culture, just because it's a little glimpse into the public opinion about the deep sea, you know, when it's used for marketing in some unusual ways. So the one that caught my eye recently, it was actually Heather Ritchie who sent this. She's been on the show as well. She came across Old Spice Deep Sea with Ocean Elements deodorant. The company describes it as the best smells on earth are smells that you haven't even smelt yet. Nice. <laughs> I did quite like leading in, but whether that's true or not, it's impossible to prove us wrong, so don't even try. That's why we sought the freshness of the deep sea, one of the most remote places on earth. It really makes you wonder if anyone has smelled the bottom of the sea before. And it's a deep sea scrub with ocean elements, smells like the sea, an unforgiving, but some would say fair mistress, with the seaside smells of citrus and flowers. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, back up there. Yeah, yeah, back yeah. Up. Oh, back no, back up, up all of it. I, I like how that's written. It's quite funny, but all of that's wrong. <laughs> Citrus and flowers is the smell of the deep sea? Lemons and tulips? I don't think so. Raising our hands as people who have smelt the deep sea, you don't want to rub that yeah. on your body. <laughs> yeah, it smells of salt, decaying organic matter and sulfur. All yeah. decaying organic matter. It's an ooze. But... Just for the record, I'm willing to take back everything I said about Old Spice Deep Sea as long as they uh, sponsor, sponsor the podcast. podcast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We've hit the two-year mark and it's, st it's still a massive loss leader. Yeah. So we're just getting desperate now. Old yeah. Spice, you need us more than we need you. <laughs> we have smelt the deep sea. Maybe we should craft an accurate one. Actually, you know what, Tom? You know, I always thought the deep sea scrub smells like the deep sea, you know, like an unforgiving, but some would say fair mistress <laughs> with the seaside smell of citrus and flowers. After our day processing deep sea fish, I sometimes don't even bother to shower because I'm just like, oh, I just smell so good. I just smell, oh, these animals, oh. they just they smell delicious. I have to really hold back from just taking a good bite out of one because they just smell, smell beautiful. It's the oranges and lemons, eh? Yeah, it's, it's the citrus zesty smells of flowers. <laughs> yeah. Hmm, not, not sure about that one. They're definitely going to sponsor that. And that concludes this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. We are a friendly bunch, so please do write in with any comments or questions. Uh, I'm really enjoying including the voices of listeners, basically, in the show. It's nice. So don't hesitate recording a quick voice memo on your phone and emailing it in. It's great to hear from you. So until the next time, we'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company, Amatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can provide the technology and know-how to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience through storytelling, fact-checking, or presentations, we can help with that as well. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone. I still can't see Tom at all. I'm <laughs> assuming we're, this is still recording. This is yeah. not going well. well. Well, I can hear the both of you. How is your editing prowess, I guess, is going to be your next question. Tom does it and he's got his work cut out for him this oh, time. Oh boy, does he. Yeah. Well, I'm having a good time, so I, I don't know if the podcast will can, work. Like, let's be honest, who cares what Tom thinks, right? <laughs> there it is. So we're enjoying ourselves. Tom is my Ziggy from Quantum Leap, so that's what he just told me. He's the voice in the back of my head. <laughs> I think Tom has really let us down. We did everything we could. You couldn't get online. Now you, you've managed to step up and actually, you know, undo a lot of the damage that Tom has done. <laughs> but once again, this is why Tom's not allowed nice things.
because we give him a nice thing and he breaks it. So, well, for the record, Tom finds that funny and he agrees with all of that. 